welcome to the 2018 Graham Clark Oration. Tonight is, of course, a celebration of frontier science, of collaboration, of scientific knowledge, and I want to start by acknowledging the first scientists who lived and walked on this land, the traditional owners, the people of the Kulin Nation, and may we continue to recognise, encourage, foster young indig Indigenous talent in science, technology and maths and medicine and beyond. I'm super excited about tonight's speaker. Uh, she's from MIT, she's a leader in nanotech in a past life, well, this life really, I've only had one. Before I was a broadcaster, I studied engineering, materials engineering, which uh, is really just nanotechnology. But of course, nanotech has uh, a snazzier name and a better marketing plan. But when you combine nanomaterials and nanotechnology with biology and medicine, that's when things get really, really interesting, and uh, which is what we'll hear tonight. And Graham Clark understood the potency and the power of combining biology and engineering when he developed with his team the cochlear implant. Tonight is a very special milestone for the oration. The event is turning 10. It's its 10th anniversary. Let's give it up for the organisers, shall we? Isn't that wonderful? And in 2008, Graham Clark himself delivered the inaugural oration. Many of you might have been here. Who was here? Excellent. Uh, and since then, of course, the room has filled up every year for this event. So it's a big thanks to you as well for supporting this oration committed to the public communication of science by international leaders. You know, this sort of annual ritual, I think, that celebrates the intellect and scientific effort really matters at a time like this one. A very special message as part of our 10th birthday. My greetings to you all. Here's a question. To which branch of science would you give the credit for the cochlear implant? Some of you are probably thinking of neuroscience or digital technology. Some would suggest artificial intelligence. But if I were to crack open a cochlear implant, I know that first and foremost, I would see a showcase of the gifts of material science. Miniature circuits, long life batteries, biocompatible polymers, Teflon, the miracle of hearing in a waterproof wireless case. Material science. It is the unsung hero of progress. And Graham Clark, one of our most venerated Australians, he would be the first to pay tribute to the maestros of matter. They made it possible to bring his vision to life. So it is fitting that we welcome a true maestro tonight for the 10th Graham Clark oration, Professor Paula Hammond. She describes cancer as a supervillain she fights it with her superpower, molecular engineering. Her super weapon, nanoparticles. And her superstar quality, inspiration. Tonight, you have the opportunity, and I wish I was in your seat, to hear from one of science's movers and makers. So here's to that unsung hero, material science. A toast to it, to Graham Clark and to Paula Hammond. Enjoy your evening. I'd like to welcome now Professor Mark Cook. He is Director of the Graham Clark Institute for Biomedical Engineering at the University of Melbourne. He's going to say a few words and introduce this year's guest speaker. Thank you. Thanks, Professor Cook. Thanks, Ms. Escher, and, and thank you and welcome all. And I'd like to greet especially uh, Laureate Professor Emeritus, Professor Graham Clark. He's down there somewhere. Uh, 
Mrs. Margaret Clark, welcome, thank you. Professor Paula Hammond, of course, Mr. Frank McGuire, Mr. Murray Thompson, and other distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome tonight to the 2018 Graham Clark Oration, and I, again, I'd like to thank you for your support, not just for this evening, but for the last nine orations that make this very special event in the biomedical sciences community and engineering community here in Melbourne. The Graham Clark Institute for Biomedical Engineering promotes and coordinates the extensive bioengineering capacities that exist across the University of Melbourne and its research institute collaborators, drawing on emerging scientific and engineering approaches to drive transformative clinical solutions. Now, people have always been interested in the celestial world. They're very interested in these huge scales and distances and the flickering lights that travel millions of light years to get to us. And hardly a week passes without some new celestial object of interest being discovered. So people are interested in, in very big numbers and, and very big distances, but tonight we're doing exactly the opposite and, and listening to very small things indeed, uh, the science of the invisible almost, a world that we can't see but one that's quickly becoming very important in the fast-changing medical landscape. It's not the world of cell behaviour or natural environments, uh, which are equally fascinating, but, um, but this is about materials which are engineered at the nano scale in billionths of a metre. Now the potential of nanotechnology has been discussed over the past few decades and it's only now that we're really seeing this come to fruition. We'll discover this evening that it's moving from the realm of theory and concepts to real applications and impact. Tonight we have the privilege of having one of the real leaders in this field to excite and inspire us about what the future holds in this new frontier of medicine. Professor Hammond is the David Koch Professor of Engineering at MIT. Uh, she received her undergraduate Bachelor of Science degree in Chemical Engineering at MIT and then went into industry and interestingly went back from industry uh, to complete a master's degree at Georgia Tech and really got bitten by the uh, bug for research and academia. She returned to MIT to undertake doctoral studies in chemical engineering and got a PhD in 1993. Since then, she's delivered on the extraordinary potential recognised by her departmental colleagues and become a leading scientist in the field of layer-by-layer -layer electrostatic assembly technique. And this is an inexpensive method of using nanoparticles to form thin films, um, a technique that's accelerated the applications of nanotechnology, as we'll hear. In 2015, Professor Hammond was appointed to head the Department of Chemical Engineering at MIT, the first woman to hold that position since it was established in 1920. Her department continues its top position in global university rankings. Professor Hammond is also a member of the Koch Institute for Integrative Cancer Research at MIT, which brings an interdisciplinary approach to advance the fight against cancer. Now, Professor Hammond's won numerous awards, too many to go through here tonight, uh, but as well, she's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, of the National Academy of Medicine, and the National Academy of Engineering. We asked Professor Hammond's PhD supervisor, Professor Michael Ruber, to describe her contributions, and I'd like to read his comments to you. Advances in nanotechnology have propelled the development of exciting new medical treatments, with great promise for improving the lives of people around the world. Nowhere is this more evident than the innovative research of Professor Paula Hammond. Professor Hammond's deep understandings of both nanomaterials and biomedical science has produced amazing possibilities in areas ranging from improved cancer treatments and novel drug delivery systems, to name just a few. Her dedication to science and the advancement of all who walk with her have really inspired a generation of new young scientists. It's my great honour to invite Professor Paula Hammond to deliver the Graham Clark Oration. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. I am so excited to be here today and very honored to give the Graham Clark Oration. I'm going to be describing to you some of the work that we do in our research lab, which involves nanotechnology and opposite attracts ideas. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about those ideas and how we can take them from larger scale systems to very tiny scale systems, all using nanotechnology. But first, I wanted to describe to you what I mean by nano. How small is nano? Many of you may already know because there are a number in the audience who are scientists and engineers. But just to give you a good idea, imagine that you pluck out a human hair, 
and you try to slice that hair lengthwise. Imagine that you slice that hair lengthwise into 10,000 evenly spaced slices. If you can imagine doing that, then you can imagine the width of each of those slices is one nanometer. Hopefully this gives you an idea of how tiny this length scale is. A number of the things I'm going to talk to you about today are somewhere in the range of a few tens of nanometers down to single nanometers. Now the way that I make these nanometer systems, and the people in my lab make them, is using positively and negatively charged material systems. This is actually a very simple process that we call layer by layer assembly. And I think of it as building with nanoscale layers. The concept is that you can start with a surface. It can be any substrate that you can imagine. If you think of metal or glass, these are surfaces that have a natural oxide surface that's negatively charged. If it's something like plastic, then you can very easily plasma treat that plastic so that it has a negative charge. You can start with virtually anything that you'd like. Now you can immerse that negatively charged system into a dilute water solution. And if that water solution contains a positively charged molecule, a molecule that has multiple positive charges, then that will actually absorb onto your substrate because it's attracted to the negative charge. You'll continue to see adsorption take place until ultimately there's enough down on that surface that you have reversed that negative charge and now have a positive charge. At that point on the substrate, you have positive charge. And in solution, you still have positively charged molecules. But now they are repelled from the surface because now you have like charges that repel. So you have a self-limiting adsorption step. You can only adsorb to the point where you reverse the charge. We create our monolayer, our singular layer. That layer can many, be anywhere from one or two nanometers thick to a few tens of nanometers thick, depending on what we're adsorbing and the conditions that we adsorb at. We can then rinse the substrate and immerse it into another water solution that contains something that is once again oppositely charged, negatively charged, and adsorbed back and forth. And you can imagine as you go from plus to minus to plus to minus, as long as you have a rinse step in between to remove anything that's not truly adsorbed electrostatically to the surface, you're going to build up a stable film. Now I'm showing these as alternating stripes because it's easier to see that way. But a lot of the materials that we work with are polymeric. They're long, uh, ma large macromolecules that are sort of windy. You can think of them as, as strands or uh, long, uh, ropey mo molecules. These are actually going to interpenetrate with each other. So they're actually a bit fuzzy, these layers. They're not very clearly defined. And on the very tiny length scale, you can imagine that they're entangled. But I can build up many layers that contain, let's say, a blue and a green molecule, an alternation, and then stop and begin to add layers that have a red and an orange set of molecules. I can introduce different molecules into the system, and there's no limit to how many layers I can build as long as I reverse the charge. Now, this can be extremely powerful, and the reason for this is that I can incorporate virtually anything into these layers, including things that normally don't like to mix together because charge is the driving force for them to come together. And the reason that we're interested in this for biomedical applications is because we can actually use this to incorporate a range of different drugs. And some of these drugs are proteins. A number of the modern drugs today are simple proteins or even more complex ones that regulate what our body does. We can also introduce DNA RNA and other nucleic acids that can regulate genes within our body. And we can even introduce small molecule drugs that have charge already on the surfaces of those molecules, or we can create charged carriers and incorporate those charged carriers with drugs into our films. So that is the general idea. And here's why we're interested in doing it. Um, I'm a polymer scientist. And one of my favorite polymers in general are the polyesters. As someone named Paula, that's you know, kind of understandable. <laughs> and a really conventional coating for drug release 
are the polylactic acids, polyglycolic acids. These are all simple polyesters. They do a good job. They have good mechanical properties. But if we try to use them to contain a range of different drugs in the same coating, <coughs> then we have some limitations. Here are some of them. One is that whenever you create a, a polymer coating in which you have to blend a small molecule, only a little bit of the molecule can be put into your polymer solution before it begins to phase separate because of instability. And that causes uh, a, system, a system that releases everything at once instead of in a controlled fashion. So I can't put a lot of drug into a polymer coating. And if I need to deliver a lot of drug, I have to have a really large, thick coating, which can be very inconvenient and ineffective. On top of that, if I want multiple drugs in my coating, if I want them to come out in different ways, it's hard to control, and typically they all come out in the same way. This is okay for some applications, but in other applications, I may want one drug to show up early and one drug to show up a little bit later. Now, uh, this is an example of a coating that might go on an orthopedic implant, one can imagine. This is actually a sketch of an orthopedic hip implant. And this is a surface that is in contact uh, with the joint. I may want to be able to create a more complex set of drugs on this surface. And this is a very narrow space. When it's put into the joint, I don't have a lot of room. I may want to pack a lot of drug there. With layer by layer, instead of getting, let's say, one weight percent or one half weight percent of drug into the film, I can actually layer different drugs with different polyelectrolytes. These are charged polymers that degrade at controlled rates. And in fact, I can control the relative rate at which the polymer degrades by changing the molecular structure. Here we're making this little region, which is essentially uh, a carbon-hydrogen bond. Uh, we're going to increase the number of these CH2 linkages and make this longer and longer. That makes it more and more water hating. That means that it takes longer and longer to degrade. I can actually tame that by layering a drug with this degradable positively charged molecule. If I have a negatively charged drug number three, I can layer it with one drug. Drug number two can be layered with another polymer. And drug number three with another polymer, each with its own relative rates of release. I can stack them in a certain way that allows them to release not only with its own relative rate of release, but perhaps staggered over time if I can create barriers between the sets of layers. This means that I can have a much more complex release profile. It also means I can put a lot more drug into an extremely thin space. Now, one can imagine why I might want to do these kinds of things. In an orthopedic implant, you can imagine that one of the earliest things you may want to take care of is infection and pain. And uh, this means releasing small molecules. We might want to release these early on in the process so that we eliminate any existing infection. However, later on, I would like bone to regrow around this implant. So I have a very nice stable implant, and it will be very difficult for infection to come back. So the first example I'm going to give to you is about growing bone using these na nano layers. And in this case, uh, I'm going to describe what we release. I mentioned that we can release a growth factor, and that growth factors control how cells behave in the body. It turns out that there are a number of natural proteins. They exist in our body now, but uh, they can be used in a way that helps us generate new tissue. One of them is called bone morphogenetic protein 2, BMP2. This is actually a growth factor that is FDA approved for spinal cord injury. Now, BMP2 is a very interesting molecule. It actually is osteoinductive. What that means is that when it is released, it creates a signal, essentially, to stem cells, the adult stem cells that reside in our bone marrow, to come to the site and differentiate into bone cells. So we're able to actually generate new bone from our own bodies. And this is one of the ways in which we can do it. Now, it's a very potent growth factor. And if we deliver it effectively, we'd like to deliver it in small amounts over long periods of time. If we deliver it in large amounts to the body, then we'll flood the body with this growth factor. 
And as it turns out, a large amount of growth factor in your bloodstream can actually lead to side effects, including cancer, because growth factors can activate also uh, these sort of hidden cancer cells that are in the body. So the idea here is to use this potent growth factor in an effective way. Another interesting growth factor is this platelet-derived growth factor, PDGF. It's called mitogenic. Uh, what it really means is that it can help support the generation of blood vessels. And one of the important things for any tissue, any vascular tissue, is to actually generate blood vessels so that that tissue can survive, provide nutrients and oxygen to that tissue. It's a critical part of generating a new tissue. All right, so I've described two proteins that are interesting. And what we can do is we can think of these proteins as molecules that we can put into our nanolayers. Now, it turns out that these proteins are positively charged. This means that we can layer them with negatively charged materials. So we have a set of positively charged degradable polymers that I showed to you earlier, and we have positively charged proteins, and we can layer them in alternation with some negatively charged polymer. So we've used a range of different polymers, natural ones uh, like polysaccharides or sugars that are negatively charged are used in this process, as well as very simple synthetic ones like polyacrylic acid. So you can imagine these as being new, uh, essentially non-active, uh, negatively charged polymers that are going to help us build the film. Now, uh, my student Nassar Shah, who uh, actually completed his PhD and is now starting his life as a, as a faculty member very soon, uh, actually worked on this problem. One of the things he wanted to look at was whether or not we could use our very thin layers to help promote healing in a cranial defect. This is actually a, a hole or missing bone that is uh, so large that it can't regrow on its own. And this can be the result of trauma. It can be the result of uh, a birth defect. It can happen anywhere in the skull or the face. Uh, so we're very interested in this kind of repair. Now, what Nassar did was use a combination of my favorite polymer, polyester, in combination with a layer-by-layer -layer assembly to replace state-of-the-art. State-of-the-art is that you take a graft from the bone, and uh, so this poor patient has to lose some more bone, uh, and grind it up, create a paste, and maybe you apply that to some sort of metal or plastic implant uh, to try and regenerate uh, the uh, growth of bone or you use stem cells. We're interested in a cell-free approach in which we can essentially generate a membrane that's very easy to make. So we take that polyester and we make a really porous version of it with a lot of holes in it. It's porous and flexible. We cut it into the size of the defect that we want to repair and then we coat it with nanolayers. And the nanolayers that we put down include bottom layers, that contain this uh, bone morphogenetic growth factor, or BMP2, and top layers that contain PDGF. And remember, PDGF helps build blood vessels. The reason we introduce these growth factors in this order is because we want to be able to generate a vascular bed and then generate bone around the vascular bed. But to understand whether or not PDGF was important, we also did experiments with just the BMP2 just forming the bone alone. So this is the foamy material with our layer-by-layer -layer film on top. This is the rapid release of the PDGF on top, which is going to take place over seven days, and the BMP2, which takes place over about a month. When we do these studies, we use a cranial defect model. So these are rats, which have a, a cranial defect. This is the control, and as you can see, if you look over time, in the micro CT, which is a kind of x-ray, there's no healing of this bone. If we put our patch with our layer-by-layer -layer film in place of, the, of this defect, we can see at different doses, at 0.2 micrograms of BMP2, that we're getting already very rapid healing and replacement of bone. We can see that if we increase the dose to two micrograms, then we end up with 
uh, the same rate. So we don't need to increase dose. We can stay at these low doses, and as you remember, low dose is what we want. In fact, uh, the levels that are introduced in the FDA-approved product are in the milligrams. Here we're working three, uh, uh, three orders of magnitude or four orders of magnitude lower than that. Now, we can also look at the case in which we have 0.2 micrograms of BMP2 and 0.2 micrograms of PDGF. In this case, with the two growth factors, it looks like it may be healing a little bit faster, but we can't tell enough from these x-rays. All we can see is that there's bone filling in. So we have to take sections of the bone and understand what the tissue looks like. Here you can see the margins. This is actually the bone uh, that was uh, originally in place. And here we see the hole. So this is a cross section of the untreated defect. If we just put the membrane with no nanolayers on top uh, in place, we get this kind of uh, flexible collagen membrane. It's kind of, uh, kind of a scruffy scab-like material, but it has no bone present and therefore is not mechanically appropriate. If we introduce 0.2 micrograms of BMP2, we get a lot of bone. Introduce or in increase the dose, we get even more bone. It looks like a lump on the head, frankly. But what you can see is that there are a lot of defects, and that bone does not look like the bone in the margins, in which we're staining for uh, both the blood vessels and the, uh, uh, the bone itself. We can see that it looks kind of disorganized and lumpy and not very well formed. When we test the mechanical properties of this bone, it breaks earlier than native bone. So it's kind of a brittle, uh, unsatisfactory bone. However, when we put the two growth factors together and release first the PDGF and then the BMP2, we see that we get this beautifully well-formed uh, uh, bone, which is highly vascularized. There are blood vessels throughout. We can count the number of blood vessels and see that that blood vessel density is higher. The bone itself is healthier. We don't have any necrotic bone, which means bone that dies because it doesn't get the nutrients that it needs. And it turns out that the mechanical properties of this bone is equal to the mechanical properties of the native skull. So we can show that using this approach of sequential release in order, we can get a very nice, well-formed tissue that is difficult to achieve with just the BMP2 alone. And in fact, it's important to have these vessels form first before the tissue becomes so calcified that the blood vessels can't penetrate the bone. We can take this one step further. Uh, a num very few of us have had to have cranial defect repair. However, imagine, I imagine there may be one or two of us, at least in the audience, who has had uh, a hip replacement or a whole shoulder replacement uh, or a knee replacement. And it turns out that these whole joint replacements are actually quite common. I think there are several reasons for that. It's actually increased over time. One of them is that we're living longer, and thank goodness for that. We're also more active. Thank goodness for that, too. That means that there are a lot of baby boomers who have ski jumped and, and uh, done rigorous exercise, et cetera, and they have had a hip replacement, and they've lived long enough that that hip replacement has begun to wear, and it comes time to replace it. Now, what happens when we replace that hip uh, joint? Here you can see uh, where the ball and joint go in a uh, titanium uh, hip replacement. This is the ball, and here is where we uh, insert the uh, implant into the femur. It turns out that if you have a replacement, you worry a lot more about infection than you do in the original operation. And the reason for this is that there's been plenty of time for bacteria to find their way into the crevices here as this begins to wear down in the body. So orthopedic surgeons in the US will uh, remove this joint and then introduce these antibiotic-containing beads into the patient, brace the hip, and uh, you essentially have to wait about six weeks uh, until we know that the infection should be cleared before we unbrace the patient, open this up, and then introduce the new implant. Now you can imagine that's two surgeries, that's six weeks in bed or braced. It's actually not a very low-cost process. It's not one that leaves patients happy, uh, and we would love to be able to replace this with a single approach. So um, this is the work of Ju Ha Min, who is a, uh, also a former PhD student who's doing her postdoc now and plans to become a professor as well. Uh, in her work, she's been incorporating the BMP2 
which she demonstrates is this green color here. And on top of the BMP2, she puts an antibiotic because she actually wants to eliminate infection in the joint. And then after you've eliminated infection, it will be safe to signal to the stem cells in your body to come to this nice, clean, uninfected region and generate new bone tissue. Now, she wanted to control the relative rate at which the gentamicin sulfate, which is the antibiotic that she's using, appears, and the BMP2 appears. And to separate them a little bit more, she introduced these little uh, nano layers that contained clay. And the clay is uh, this disc-shaped, silicate, coin-shaped uh, material. It's biocompatible, generally regarded as safe, and it actually increases cell adhesion properties. So she thought she could use essentially these as kind of diffusion barriers so that it takes a little bit longer for the BMP2 to degrade and come out of these films. Here you can actually see uh, what it looks like to do some of her work. Uh, on the top you can see her building up these thin films which contain tetra layers of BMP2. Then she introduces a clay layer. You can see the increase in the thickness of the film. The gentamicin sulfate goes on and then the laponite. The laponite layer is extremely thin. You can also use electron microscopy to see the structure of her film. Here the brightness shows where the silicate is and she used a silica kind of underlayer, BMP2, the laponite clay layers, gentamicin sulfate and laponite. And in red you can see that she was using uh, essentially a version of this uh, electron microscopy in which you can see the, at the atomic uh, nature by looking at colors. So here red indicates silicon atoms. And you can see that uh, we have this separation between the layers with the film. So she has these very nice separated systems and she can vary the release characteristics. When she has no diffusion barriers in between her BMP2 and her genomycin sulfate, here BMP2 is blue, gentamicin sulfate is red. The gentamicin comes out very rapidly, a large amount at once. It's excellent for eliminating an infection, but then it's sort of gone after the first 10 days or so. BMP2 comes out, it's separated, but it's not separated a lot, just a little bit uh, from the gentamicin sulfate, so that you get maybe about a half of it being released somewhere in 10 day period. If she puts just uh, a singular set of laponite layers in here, uh, then she gets a 14 times longer release period for her BMP2. So here you can see that it's sort of uh, drawn out over time, whereas the gentamicin is unchanged. So that diffusion layer is helping to slow down the rate at which BMP2 arrives, and that helps in clearing the infection early and then generating new bone. She was also interested in uh, this whole idea of not only getting rid of the infection, but preventing any new infection from taking place. Now you can introduce a bolus, a large amount of anti-infective at once, and that will clear infection, but over time you might get new bugs that arrive. You need to keep the antibiotic at a level, some sort of critical minimum level, uh, to prevent any new, anti new um, bacteria from showing up. So what she did was put a capping layer on top, and that capping layer suppressed the release of the gentamicin just enough that she was able to get a large amount out at once to eliminate infection, and then this sort of extended drain off of gentamicin sulfate that allowed us to maintain that minimum inhibitory concentration that we need to prevent reinfection. And here you can see that she's able to then get the control that she wanted to uh, get regeneration of bone. So in her model, she uh, essentially generated a rat tibia infection model. What happens is that she creates a hole in, in the tibia, allows it to become infected with, uh, in this case, Staph aureus, which is one of those nasty bugs. And uh, then she inserts an implant coated with her coating. This is an untreated implant, and the green shows regeneration of bone. And as you can see, bone is having an, a very hard time being regenerated in the presence of this infection. If you look here at micro CT, you even see that you're losing bone. That's called bone resorption. Uh, the presence of this bacterial infection is breaking down the bone. 
Now, if you look at this, the case where you're just releasing antibiotic and nothing else, you clear the infection, and slowly, 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 the bone begins to regenerate. However, when we think about patient needs, slowly, slowly, slowly isn't necessarily what you need. You want to build strong bone, you want to build it well, but you also want to build it quickly enough that the patient can recover and begin to be mobile earlier. So it turns out that with the combination of BMP2 and gentamicin sulfate together, we can actually regenerate the bone much more rapidly. By five to six weeks, we have a full coating of bone it's integrated throughout the implant. And uh, here we can see, just, these are just simply different angles of the micro CT, uh, that in the case of the combination, that we get a very nice regeneration of bone for this implant. Now I've talked about things that are sort of big. Uh, now I'll talk a little bit about things that are incredibly small. We talked about the size of nanometers, and these nanolayers are certainly along that range. It turns out that you can coat not only big things like implants with layer-by-layer -layer films, you can also coat incredibly tiny things with the same kinds of layers. We can take a nanoparticle, a particle that is, let's say, 10 or 20 or 40, 100 nanometers in size, and we can, as long as it's charged, absorb a polyelectrolyte onto that surface of opposite charge. And then we can rinse it, and then we can deposit another charged polymer. And we can continue to alternate to build up this film that essentially has layers of different types wrapped around the nanoparticle. It turns out that this is a very straightforward process. And um, we've been using this process uh, to deliver therapeutics to very specific parts of the body. Now, this is what that looks like. Here you can see. Uh, a, a very simple um, polystyrene latex particle that has been coated with our layer-by-layer -layer film, and it looks like a halo. You can't see the different layers differentiate it because they all have very similar content. So in the electron microscope, they all look the same. So you see this kind of translucent halo. We can coat particles of any, any kind of uh, shape or size. Here you can see an oblong particle. And uh, we can put down as many layers as we want. In fact, I like to think of this as something like uh, the Wonka gobstopper. For those of you who may remember this as a, a candy, in fact, my postdoc went and got the candy and a saw and sawed across to get this picture. But it gives you the general idea that we can put whatever we want into these outer layers. And we can design the nanoparticles so that it slowly dissolves or expands and releases what's in the layers bit by bit. And we can design the outer regions of these nanoparticles so that cells that see these particles want to take them up into their interior. And that is how we can deliver drug to these cells. So we are actually using this to address cancer. And uh, it's really a very simple concept. We take a nanoparticle, and the nanoparticles that we use are about 100 nanometers, right around this size, not too far from the size of viruses. And as you know, viruses are very clever microorganisms. They get into uh, many parts of our body. Well, we try to mimic some of the capabilities of viruses by the way that we decorate these nanoparticles and by the nature of size. Now, what we do with this system is we start with a core, an empty core, that we can fill with a chemotherapy drug. We might use a really common one. A really common one is doxorubicin. Uh, it's packaged today in a formulation known as doxel. Some, some of you may have heard of that. We also use platinum-based drugs, like cisplatin. Um, a number of you may have been fami become familiar with that drug. We incorporate the chemotherapy drug into the core, and using a charged core, we then layer a positively charged polymer, and then some nucleic acid. This nucleic acid is something that we're going to use to somehow reprogram the way the tumor cell works. It turns out that, of course, uh, tumors are the result of genetic modifications. And these cancer cells that undergo these genetic changes undergo changes because they have um, some sort of change in their DNA. Now, it turns out that some of those changes are actually helpful to the tumor cell. Some of them actually allow tumor cells to survive even in the presence of the drugs that we deliver to them. 
So we are going to incorporate RNA, silencing RNA, that will turn off some of the genes that enable these tumor cells to be resistant to the chemotherapy that we're trying to deliver. And we're going to put it in these outer layers so that the tumor cell sees the silencing RNA first, the gene is shut off, and now that the tumor cell is defenseless, we can deliver the chemotherapy drug. So that explains why we have a positively charged layer, so that we can introduce this negatively charged uh, siRNA. But siRNA breaks down very easily in the blood. It turns out that siRNA is broken down by a number of the enzymes present in our blood. It's, a, it's actually a defense mechanism that our body has. We need to protect our siRNA by essentially wrapping another layer around it. We're going to put another polycation, positively charged material around it, and now it's protected on both sides. But finally, you know, if we just introduce the nanoparticle in this form with a lot of positive charge, it turns out that a large number of our uh, proteins in our bloodstream are negatively charged, and we're going to create a bit of a mess. We're going to introduce these positively charged particles in the bloodstream, they're going to absorb all of these random proteins, and they're going to be recognized as foreign matter, and the body will get rid of them rapidly. To avoid that process, we wrap one more layer on top. Now, this layer needs to be, for us, negatively charged. We can take advantage of the fact that a large number of the uh, mammalian cells, including the blood cells in our body, have a net negative charge, so there can be some repulsion so that these healthy cells don't interact with our nanoparticle. It also turns out that a lot of the negatively charged materials that we choose, they tend to accumulate water and hold water molecules close. And this high affinity for water molecules that our negatively charged polymers have tend to create a kind of water halo. So you can imagine now that you have a nanoparticle that is sheathed with negative charge and water molecules that it can actually have a kind of invisibility cloak, if you want to think of it that way. It looks to many other cells as just floating water. Of course, doing all of this work means uh, putting in a lot of molecular engineering and physical chemistry know-how to design the nanoparticle and to understand what systems will encapsulate the sRNA effectively, what systems will give us this stealth layer that's very effective, and how well we can design it so that it releases the RNA at the right time when we get inside the cell. But we also have to talk to our biologists uh, our biology friends know what kinds of sequences might be used to help us get entry into the cell and what kinds of things we need to put into these layers uh, to have an effective therapy. And finally, we need to talk to uh, clinicians, clinicians who understand uh, what patients can tolerate, what kinds of treatments are going to be more effective, and what forms of cancer we need to really focus on. So we have this modular design that lets us change all of these things. One of the things that we use as a way to get where we want to go with this nanoparticle is size itself. I mentioned that viruses are very small, and they can penetrate into many parts of our body. It turns out that uh, for a large number of tumors, there's such a rapid growth that the tumor is creating these blood vessels rapidly. And in creating these blood vessels rapidly, it creates defective blood vessels. There are little leaks or holes or defects in those blood vessels in the tumor. This is something that has been observed frequently, for example, not only in brain tumors, but in a range of uh, pancreatic and uh, prostate cancers. Uh, if we can take advantage of that, then we can use the nano size to inject our nanoparticle in the bloodstream. We'll have our stealth nanoparticle going through the bloodstream untouched, but when it gets to the tumor blood vessels, then these nanoparticles can leak into the tumor through the holes and spend a little bit of time in the tumor tissue before they find a new leak that they can leak back out into. I kind of uh, show up, think of this as something like a pinball machine. And I don't know how many of you ever played a pinball machine. I don't know if they still make pinball machines. <laughs> but for those of you who remember, there's that metal ball and you pull the lever, or maybe you, this is a, a, actually a wooden simple version. Uh, you have a wooden ball and you have these levers and you paddle the ball up. It doesn't go straight down. Instead, it hits all of these pockets and 
little regions and whirls around, and it takes time before it makes its way back down again. The same idea with this nanoparticle finding a leak in the blood vessel, it goes in, and now it's moving around the tumor tissue. And until it finds another hole to go out of, it's going to dwell with our tumor cells. And this is our opportunity to get that nanoparticle to be taken up by the tumor cells to deliver our therapy. This is actually a mouse model in which we have little tumors on the backs of mice, one, two, three, four, five, six. And uh, what we've done is uh, we've layered a quantum dot so that uh, quantum dot is fluorescent and we can see it. And uh, we inject through the tail vein of the animal and immediately the, the entire animal lights up. But over time, this is after 24 hours, the only place where the nanoparticles have accumulated are in these tumors. So size is one way of getting in. But once we're in to the tumor, we've created this stealth outer layer. So why would a tumor cell take up our package when we have designed the package for cells to leave the nanoparticle alone? We need a way to get tumor cells to want to take up the nanoparticle, even though healthy cells will ignore it. So there are a few ways in which we do this. One way is to take advantage of the fact that the tumor environment itself, it's a little different from regular tissues. Some of these subtle differences include the fact that tumors are just a little bit acidic, just a little bit. Again, this has to do with the fact that tumors aren't great at getting oxygen to the tissue, and therefore they are slightly hypoxic. They don't have the same oxygen levels as our regular tissue. And because of that, uh, the net result is that the area is slightly acidic. So if normal pH is 7.4, tumors might be around 7 or 6.8, depending on the degree of, tox of hypoxia that that tumor expresses. What we were learning in generating our layer-by-layer -layer films is that when we introduce positively and negatively charged polymers that can respond to pH with a shift in charge, we can actually design systems that undergo a change in net charge when we shift the pH of the tumor. So here's a, a nanoparticle at pH 7.4. Uh, it has a dense, very hydrated layer that's about 17 nanometers thick. And you can actually see it, hopefully, this little halo. Uh, when it goes down to very low pHs, we get a lot of swelling. And the reason for this is because it turns out that there are acid groups, carboxylic acid groups, they exist as COO minus. For those of you who didn't like chemistry a lot, this is only a small amount of chemistry. Uh, COO minus, you add a proton, and it goes to COOH, and it loses its negative charge. So what is happening here is that we're doing that to a lot of these negatively charged groups. And if we do that, we're erasing negative charge. Because the complex was built on plus minus, plus minus, if we erase negative charge, then we lose those ionic crosslinks that were holding things together, and the film swells slowly. Uh, at very low pHs, it can release our siRNA that's inside. And that's how we think we can deliver the uh, drug or the siRNA, because when it gets taken up by the cell, it goes into an endosomal compartment that goes down to very low pHs, five and a half to six. However, in the in-between space, when it's in the tumor tissue, it undergoes a more subtle change. It becomes, rather than a strong negatively charged nanoparticle, kind of a neutral one. And that loss of charge makes the nanoparticle a system that the tumor cells become kind of interested in. It's no longer repulsive. It's got kind of a softer, fluffier layer. And it turns out that uh, it undergoes these very nonspecific, not very special, uh, routine interactions with the nanoparticle that lead to engulfment of the nanoparticle into uh, the compartment of the cell. So the idea here is that we have a nanoparticle that slowly changes in the tumor environment so that it goes from being a stealth particle to being a sticky particle. And in becoming a sticky particle, it begins to bind and interact with the cell membrane and ultimately be taken up by the cell. All right, so we have size, and we have this dynamic uh, shift to stickiness using the tumor microenvironment. That's helpful, but we would like to have even more precise targeting of our nanoparticle. 
And as I mentioned, we can rely on leaky vasculature to some extent, but we need to get them through other ways because not all tumor blood vessels are as leaky. So uh, we're not going to rely on hypoxia. This is actually a hypoxic region of tumor, and we can see the nanoparticles are glowing. Uh, you get this yellow glow where they accumulate in the hypoxic regions. We're also going to rely on other kinds of binding interactions. And it turns out that cells, they tend to express these proteins on their surfaces that bind to other things. And this is how they take in nutrients, and this is how they receive signaling. This is how they know um, to bind to something like BMP2 to become a bone cell if they are a stem cell. Well, we can take advantage of some of those kinds of proteins that are present on a cell surface by decorating our nanoparticle so that it binds specifically to the receptors that are overexpressed on tumor cells. And as luck would have it, we had already been using a very natural polysaccharide known as hyaluronic acid. You can actually buy hyaluronic acid in, in the health store, it turns out, and it shows up in a lot of our cosmetics. It's very hydrated uh, polysaccharide. It turns out that hyaluronic acid is not only a great negatively charged, water-loving outer layer, but it also binds to a receptor, receptors called CD44, and it's highly overexpressed on tumor cells. Now, I apologize for the whole CD44 thing. My biology friends love to name things with numbers and letters, and uh, they often don't correlate with anything else. However, CD44 is uh, the receptor that is overexpressed on a very large number of, of highly aggressive tumor types, including ovarian cancer, prostate cancer, triple negative breast cancer, and non-small cell lung cancer. And because of that, it turns out that hyaluronic acid layered particles accumulate strongly in all of these cells. The cells just bind to them and take them up. And you can see our red labeled nanoparticles in the body of these cells. Blue are the nuclei. Uh, and the nanoparticles shown here in the tumor tissue are labeled with a green dye. And you can see that they overlap with the CD44 receptor in the tumor tissue, right in the core of this tissue. So this is a protective stromal layer, and this is the tumorigenic tissue, and we can see that we can penetrate right into that tumor. All right, so we need to think about a treatment. I've been talking about how we get into the tumor. I've been talking about how we can use different methods of doing that. How do we use that as a way to get treatment in? We're going to choose siRNA that is essentially silencing a gene that enables the tumor cell to survive. This was actually an example of one that was very well characterized, so we used it as our first example. Again, my, my wonderful biology friends, and, I, and they are good friends of mine, uh, used several labels for this protein, MRP1 or ABCC1. Okay. <laughs> and I'm not sure where, where, the, where the rhyme and reason is for the name, but MRP stands for multi-resistant protein, multi-drug resistant protein. It is a protein that acts like a pump. It sits at the membrane of the cell, the tumor cell. And then, let's say our therapeutic is doxorubicin or cisplatin. These are DNA damaging drugs that you may read about. They're used very commonly. When these enter the cell, the uh, pump actually pumps them out again. It pumps them out so rapidly that they have very little impact on the cell because they have to reach the nucleus to cause the DNA damage. I think of it as sort of the baby spits it out gene. Have any of you fed a baby that didn't like what you were feeding it? And it food goes in and then it immediately starts dribbling down the chin and out again? This is exactly what these tumor cells are able to do with MRP1. So uh, we're going to try and silence the gene that makes that pump. So what we did in our experiment was formulate a nanoparticle. The nanoparticle had doxorubicin on the inside. It had our positive charge. It had siRNA to silence MRP1, then positive charge, and then hyaluronic acid. We have a saline control where we inject mice with just saline. And uh, this is our, our, our negative control. So what we see is that the tumors just continue to grow on the backs of these mice. They grow very rapidly. It's a very aggressive tumor type. It's a triple negative breast cancer tumor cell, uh, cell line. 
if we just put doxorubicin into the core, but we don't have any kind of meaningful siRNA, we use a scrambled up RNA code that does nothing, uh, we see that we kind of lower the rate of growth of the tumor, they're not as big. Here you can see the actual sizes plotted for our control in green and in black, and for just doxorubicin in blue. And you can see them growing over time, and they don't grow as fast. That's a good thing. It means that our nanoparticle is getting the drug more effectively into the tumor. However, if we administer the doxorubicin nanoparticle with siRNA against that MRP1 pump, we see that we not only uh, get a lessening in the growth of these tumors, we see that the tumors are actually regressing, as you can see in uh, the red data shown here. And this gave us encouragement because it was a very aggressive line. Very briefly, we found that was uh, very encouraging, but we needed to test this in more meaningful uh, examples of cancer. And we moved to more ris realistic tumor models that are provided by our friends at the Koch Institute. Uh, biologist uh, Tyler Jacks has a model of non-small cell lung cancer, which tumors are generated spontaneously in the lungs of the mice. And uh, these tumors have two really well-known genetic modifications that make the tumors highly resistant. One of them is called KRAS. This is an oncogene, an oncogene that makes these tumors extremely aggressive. It turns out that you can't find a small molecule that blocks this KRAS oncogene. So using siRNA to silence the gene is actually a great solution. Another really common mutation, uh, it turns out that all of our cells have a guardian gene. That guardian gene, at least one of them, is called P53. And I, I, by now, I'm sure you've forgiven me for all of these <laughs> names. Uh, but P53 is a guardian gene that essentially monitors the amount of gene modification or DNA damage that's occurred in a cell. If it's a moderate amount, it repairs it. And if it's gone too far, it actually causes the cell to kill itself, kind of a kamikaze cell death, because you know it knows that this cell should not survive. It's about to become cancerous. In cancer, in a number of the cancers we're interested in, P53 undergoes a single point mutation, or it gets lost entirely. And it loses its ability to do this monitoring. So we're going to try and replace the P53 guardian function with another RNA called a microRNA. And that microRNA will introduce some of this traffic comp role that P53 used to and help cells that need to die because they're cancerous die. Again, we have the same composition I talked about before, so I won't go into details, but we're going to put a different chemotherapy drug in. This time, we're going to use cisplatin because cisplatin is used in a lot of lung cancer treatments. And we're going to uh, measure the rates of release, and we see that siRNA comes out early, silences the gene, cisplatin comes out slowly, uh, and therefore we get silencing, and we turn off the gene first, and then we kill the tumor cell. Here, what we were looking at was where the nanoparticle goes when we inject the nanoparticle into the bloodstream of mice. In healthy mice, over a short period of time, the nanoparticles just go through the bloodstream, go out the back end, and uh, get cleared through the liver. However, in these lung cancer, these mice that have lung cancer, there are many tumor nodules all along the lungs, we see that there's a huge accumulation of the nanoparticle in those lungs. And we can see that with the fluorescence differences from left to right. And we can see it with quantitative measurements. Uh, here, um, the amount in healthy lungs versus in tumored lungs. We can, we can then measure the size of the tumors. And uh, we use micro CT to do this because instead of having one large luminescent tumor, we have um, these tumors spread all over the place. So I had my uh, student actually outline where he can see the tumor. And uh, you're looking at pre and post uh, the period of time that we allow these tumors to grow. When we have a treatment with just the RNA, we can reduce uh, the tumor size a little bit. When we have just the cisplatin, we can reduce it a little bit. But we get a really serious reduction of the tumors when we have the combination therapy. 
And here you can see the survival rate of the mice. And again, the control, the mice die in day 10. This is a really aggressive model. Um, and there's not very much that we get from just the RNA alone. Cisplatin helps a little bit, but the combination gives us a 30% extension of life over that of the mice that just got the cisplatin. Now, um, I'm going to end by talking about uh, a collaboration. The reason I chose to do this is because I think science is an incredibly, incredibly fun and social process. It turns out that we work very nicely with our friends, and some of the best science comes from collaborations. Now, I have a wonderful friendship and collaboration with Angie Belcher. She's another incredible uh, engineer. She actually engineers viruses to uh, make designer materials of all kinds, and she is an expert in nanotechnology for optical materials as well. Now, Angie has been using some of her science to design nanoparticles that uh, essentially can image cancer in a different part of the infrared region. We're used to being able to image using a few different methods, including uh, uh, magnetic resonance or MRI. That doesn't get us very high resolution. We can't see details very well. And uh, a range of um, uh, our, uh, infrared methods. Infrared is interesting, but the problem is that we've been working in the, this range of the near-infrared wavelength. And it turns out that infrared light can't penetrate that far into tissue. We're very interested in addressing ovarian cancer. Ovarian cancer is difficult to detect, and when it is found, it's spread all over the, the, the uh, cavity uh, in which the ovaries exist. Uh, for that reason, surgeons have a hard time finding these tumors. So in the near infrared, too, this is a new region of the infrared um, that allows us to penetrate much more deeply into the tissue without uh, disrupting the patient. It also has less background noise, and these advantages allow uh, a much better imaging approach. Now, the problem is that we have the nanoparticle Angie's developed, but how do we get it to the tumors? So we've actually been using our layer-by-layer -layer approach of putting down a bilayer, simple bilayer, that will target ovarian tumors. They also overexpress CD44. They actually allow high accumulation and uptake using hyaluronic acid as the outer layer. And the fact that we have the dynamic layer-by-layer -layer film means that the pH responsiveness is extremely effective. So in working with Angie, we looked to see whether or not we could get these native sort of uh, ovarian cancer uh, tumor nodules imaged through a mouse. Uh, and this is uh, using the IR imager that was built in Angie's lab. Angie's a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm kind of a soft material scientist, and Angie works with what I call hard materials, the inorganic materials. She also has a, a, some real hardcore um, device people in her lab who build their own imaging to, uh, systems. And we actually were using tumor cells that had a fluorescent label so that we could correlate between where we knew tumors existed and where the imager told us tumors existed. And we found that we got down to some very, very fine details, finding not only the tumor in the ovaries, but finding tumor that had spread to the pancreas, the liver, and to other organs. So uh, we've been actually excited about being able to do this work. And we're trying to adapt this modular approach to other kinds of uh, conditions. For example, we think that we can design layer-by-layer -layer nanoparticles to target infectious disease. For example, infections that exist in the lung. We can use the same kind of outer layers, but design them so that they're very effective in penetrating the biofilms that are formed by bacteria, or the mucosal layers, the mucous layers of the lung or the cervix. And we can make them dynamic to be responsive to infection conditions within the biofilm. We can put in cargo layers that contain both traditional and non-traditional drugs that can weaken the bacterial defense mechanisms and uh, essentially address uh, the issue of antimicrobial resistance. And the idea then is that by using multiple approaches, we can kill these highly resistant kinds of uh, bacteria, including uh, MRSA, a number of us have heard of MRSA infections in wounds, uh, as well as uh, very difficult to clear infections uh, in uh, 
cases such as TB. Uh, and of course, this is ongoing work that we're doing in Singapore, and we're very excited about getting started in that work. So I'm going to conclude by saying that these layer-by-layer -layer films, these nanolayers, they can be used to essentially coat, or I consider this kind of a shrink wrapping, around almost any surface. We talked about the fact that we could coat uh, these kinds of cranial defects and implants. I didn't talk about it, but we can coat surfaces that can be used for wound healing, uh, like this nylon mesh tegaderm, which is a bandage kind of material, and deliver therapeutics that help wounds heal, including diabetic ulcers. And we can wrap these nanoparticles and address cancer. As I mentioned before, science is fun. It's fun because it isn't really a lonely pursuit. It's a creative pursuit. And it benefits from uh, many, uh, many particle interactions, if I can say that. Interactions with our friends. Here I am with my friend Angie and with uh, my other friend, Sangeeta Bhatia. We're holding signs that say, I look like an engineer. <laughs> because we know all engineers look like us. Uh, this is uh, one of my... Uh, friends uh, in the Koch Institute, Mike Yaffe, who's a systems biologist. He uses even more alphabetic and alphanumeric combinations than I used in this talk. Uh, these are some of the group images. This is uh, my lab going out on one of our group outings, uh, going out uh, on one of these Boston Harbor cruises. And here we're doing uh, the rowing. And one of the things you see is me. I was at the back. And <laughs> I had to make them stop and wait for me, at which point someone took the picture there. And this is my lab. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the funders of the work that I described and uh, acknowledge all of the many hands that go into this work, uh, scientists of every age and size and culture, ethnic group and gender, and I think it's that diversity that really improves our science. I'd like to thank you for your attention, and uh, I look forward to having a chance to talk to maybe some of you during dinner. Thank you so much. <laughs> Professor Paula Hammond. particularly love is that this is such foundational science. It's the foundational science that we learn at high school, that opposites attract, and that you're using these to develop such high-tech, high-resolution methods of drug delivery at that nanoscale. It's kind of a wonderful combination, that, isn't it? It's really wonderful when you take something simple and use it in many different ways, and this is something that gets us excited. It's great. It takes me back to Van de Graaff generators and, you know, <laughs> <laughs> from our childhood. Absolutely. Well, at this point, I'd like to welcome to the stage to join you, Paula, uh, Laureate Professor Emeritus Graham Clark to deliver some words and to give his thanks. Stay with us. Professor Cook, Professor Hamill, and distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. That was a brilliant address, and I am really excited. And uh, thank you for sharing your insights. Um, I can see now, with the new frontiers of medicine, we're breaking down any barriers between basic science and engineering. And uh, I think also, you're entering the phase of surgery and making surgery easier, especially for orthopedics. And I hope too that it will lead on to uh, brain surgery and improved cochlear implants. Maybe even too, we will see uh, improvements in the treatment of Alzheimer's disease and uh, other uh, intractable conditions. I can understand, too, why uh, the MIT Chemical Engineering Department is the best in the world. Uh, it certainly is very uh, distinguished. I believe, too, 
that as nanomedicine comes of age, we will see the treatment and benefits for drug resistant epilepsy, improved bionic ears even, improved bionic eyes, spinal cord repair, and uh, I think we might even see cancer cornered and uh, infection too. We're also indebted to our sponsors for making it possible to hear uh, these wonderful developments that are about to and are taking place. In conclusion, I would also like to stress that Professor Hamilton is a, both a brilliant and dedicated scientist, but also a great role model for young people who are entering or will enter on a scientific career, and I believe there are many here tonight. As a mark of our appreciation, I would like to present you a token of our appreciation. This is a model of the uh, human cochlea, um, a little larger than normal. <laughs> and uh, it also represents uh, an interaction between medicine and engineering. And uh, we hope that uh, nanomedicine will make it even possible to have near normal hearing with bionic ears, bionic eyes, and many other advances. So thank you once again. It was exciting, and uh, I, I'm really excited. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. have a little photo opportunity, shall we? <laughs> thank you, Professor Clark, and thank you, Professor Paula Hammond. What a treat to have those two on stage together. And congratulations, Graeme, for the 10th anniversary of the oration in your name. It's a wonderful legacy to keep celebrating together here in Melbourne every year with such a wonderful turnout from Melburnians. And thank you, Professor Paula Hammond, for joining us from MIT in Boston. I know you've been meeting Australian colleagues while you've been here, and uh, we love this sort of cross-fertilisation, this, this cross-fertilisation of ideas and expertise. It benefits us all. And I know if you look at the Twitter feed for hash GC oration, uh, there was a fantastic Women in STEM event today as well, which Paula hosted and spoke at. So follow the threads. I know they were tweeting up a storm to spread the good word of the woman, Women in STEM movement that we can all support. So this brings to a close the 2018 Graham Clark oration. We'd like to extend our thanks to the many sponsors that make this event possible. It would not happen without you. And these are our sponsors on each side of the stage. So let's give them a big round of applause. Thank you. These institutions really matter. They put money behind these events and that makes this sort of conversation possible. We'd also like to thank and celebrate the organisers of the Graham Clark Oration this year, the Convergent Science Network and the Graham Clark Institute for Biomedical Engineering. Thank you for being here. Have a fantastic night and have a great year.